Today I'll be restoring a Gruen Caliber 826 and talking about its obscure history. I originally found one of these movements at a flea market, which led me down the rabbit hole and spurred me to buy more. After four years of buying them off eBay anytime I saw them listed, I finally have enough pieces to make a working one. To save time, I won't be showing the disassembly of the watch. Instead, I'll move right on to assembling right after I cleaned all the components. Just a disclaimer, a lot of the information on this topic is limited, and the information that is available can be conflicting at times, but I tried my best to get it close to accurate as possible. This watch was made around 1929, and would you be shocked if I told you Gruen and Rolex had similar movements at this time? The story starts in 1878 when John Engler opened a watch factory in Bienne, Switzerland. Specializing in ladies' pendant watches gave them an advantage once wristwatches started to become a trend in the early 1900s. During the early stages of the Egler factory, they produced movements and complete watches under the name Reberg, named after the vineyard district the factory was located in. In 1905, Hans Wilsdorf started to form a relationship with the company and started ordering movements for his Rolex watches. It's not clear when Egler started to supply movements to Gruen as well, but it was also around this time period. At this time, Gruen was by far a more advanced operation, being established in 1874 compared to Rolex in 1905. Both, though, saw where the market was headed at this time, and that is pocket watches becoming out of trend and wristwatches being acceptable for men to wear. The Great War, which happened shortly after, pushed the openness of wearing wristwatches, since it proved how useful a watch was on the wrist. Egler's precise ladies' movements were a perfect fit for both the watch brand's wristwatch needs. In 1916, Wilsdorf opened an office close to the Egler factory in Bienne. During the Great War, Britain imposed high import tariffs, which further pushed Wilsdorf to move his operations from Britain to Switzerland. Gruen already had a company set up in this region in 1903, but its main headquarters was in Ohio. Over the next two decades, both Gruen and Rolex produced models with movements coming from the Egler factory. Examples include the Rolex Prince to the Gruen Techni Quadron. And also this Gruen 826 to the Rolex's Caliber 710. Here is an ad for this Gruen watch stating it's built for the professional in mind. This was marketed towards people like doctors and engineers, 
that needed precision down to the seconds. The model currently being restored can be seen on the lower left of this ad. This is an ad from 1929. The watch at that time was sold for $35, which in today's money would be around $600. Around that time in the late 1920s, Rolex and Gruen were the largest customers to the Egler factory. Gruen and Rolex both owned large shares in Egler as well, so much so that in 1925 they officially registered under this trading name. Here is an actual aerial photo of the factory in 1929. During this time, when both brands were shareholders, they set up an agreement for Gruen to sell Egler watches only in the U.S., while Rolex sold them everywhere else. Adverts for both brands feature the Egler factory, and funny enough, each one only had their name on the building. During the Great Depression, Rolex's business was hit hard, which made Igler buy many shares to ensure the company's survival, since it was their largest client. Both companies were able to recover from the Depression, however, with Gruen doing better than most U.S.-based companies at the time. But the dual ownership would come to an end in 1936, when Gruen would sell all their shares back to the company and focus entirely on their in-house precision factory close by. Egler quickly dropped Gruen from the name and made a deal with Rolex to sell their movements exclusively to them. From there, the Rolex success story is relatively well documented. In 2004, the Egler factory was bought out entirely by Rolex, ending Egler's independent ownership. Just as a side note, I looked up the patent listed on the dial side, and it looks like it was registered for how the crown wheel core is secured to the bridge. Gruen met a much different end. In 1958, Gruen Industries was broken up and sold in pieces, eventually even selling their precision factory in Switzerland to Rolex in 1977, which became the Rolex Administration Building. They ended up like many great American watchmaking names of the past, becoming a shell of its former self for companies to buy for its reputation, only to stamp the name on cheap quartz watches from Hong Kong. The difference in outcomes is wildly different with Rolex being the hottest watch brand of the decade and not an end in sight, 
but what gave it the edge? A few reasons that could explain why Rolex was the more successful company is as follows. Rolex developed a more robust and sports-like watch with its innovations such as the oyster case, magnifying date, and self-winding feature. Gruen, on the other hand, went with a more slim dress watch, with not much new innovations after the Curvex. If you don't know what a Curvex is, check out my other video on my channel. Gruen also had an identity crisis compared to the Rolex look. Rolex watches have a certain style to them, while Gruen's aren't as recognizable. They also struggled with the amount of models they came out with, which neared 3,000 unique models. Rolex was far better with keeping a tight list of models. Another reason was the marketing. Rolex centered its ads around public celebrities, feats of achievement, and also sponsoring sport events. Gruen, on the other hand, started very strong in marketing as well. Being called Gruen Guild at the time portrayed them as a guild in medieval times. But in 1935, the theme was dropped, which ruined the brand image after that point. The final major blow Gruen took was World War II, which saw American watch factories converted to military production. Switzerland was not affected by this since they were neutral. Private use consumers thus started to get used to Swiss movements. This eventually led to a lot of American brands not getting back much of the market share they lost before the war. Gruen, like many other watch companies at the time, resorted to diversifying its product lines with things like pens. Although the real Gruen isn't around anymore, it's ultimately something that happens to every company, and it had a successful run for many decades. At least we get examples like this of the work they did in the past. It does make you think of how different of an outcome both companies could have had, since at the time, before the Depression, a merge between the two brands was talked of, but it never materialized anything.
It may be surprising seeing the hidden ties between two very unlikely companies, or it may just seem that way. Gruen in the 1920s was one of the largest watchmaking companies in America. And at that time, most people would probably bet on Gruen surviving over Rolex. Another company that had close ties with Gruen at this time was Alpina. In 1929, Alpina Gruen Guild was formed as a union to help secure Swiss market shares in Europe for high quality watches. They were able to pool resources together and market almost identical watches under different brand names, as well as gain access to each other's distribution networks. Before 1930, the Alpina Gruen Guild had more than 1,500 watch dealers under contract. Herman Egler, the owner of the Egler factory at the time, was vice president of the Alpina Gruen BN region for many years. Here's a picture of the company sales meeting in 1929. It turned out to be an unfortunate timing with the Great Depression happening the same year it was formed. This led to friction in the union when Gruen refused to contribute financially to the annual catalog demanded by Alpina. They also prevented Alpina from expanding into the American market, fearing they would lose customers at such a desperate time. Due to the constant friction and the difficult economy, the guild made operational losses. It eventually dissolved in 1935, only six years since its inception. Gruen at that point never again tried to gain a foothold in the European market. I hope more eyes are put on Gruen watches of this era, although I know prices may go up on eBay to my dismay, I think Gruen should be respected as a brand. Its history is hard to track sometimes due to most of its archives being destroyed, 
In spite of this, it remains an important part of horology history and American history in general. And that's the majority of the information on this topic I could find. Hopefully you found the relationship as interesting as I did, and please enjoy the rest of the restoration.
I love the look of this watch in particular mostly because of the cushion case and flame blued hands. The sweeping seconds hand looks to be tempered to a more reddish color which is a nice touch in aesthetic. I am also happy there's no radium on the dial which was used a lot at this time. Hopefully you enjoyed the video and please like and subscribe. It helps me grow and gives me more motivation to make videos.